Um, I was a uh, freshman at MIT. I had friends who um, I had recently made who were computer geeks. I'm a biologist. And in our dorm, there was a computer room which had two old deck line printer terminals. And they said, there's this game you've got to try out. It's called Adventure. It's really great. And they showed me how to play Adventure. And uh, I would try to get in, you know, time at the computer room whenever I could. But, you know, it being MIT with lots of computer science majors, it was a little hard to get in there. I actually never finished Adventure while I was at MIT. It was many years later on a, like a PC greatest games of all time collection that I finally played it all the way through. Dug out my old map from my files and finished it. But yeah, you'd sit there with a little 300 baud telephone modem and type in a line, you know, get lamp and wait a minute, two minutes, and then you know, they would type the thing out. So there was a certain amount of built-in anticipation with the game. But so I was like 1977, 78. That there was this sort of um, ongoing puzzle, a series of puzzles that you had to solve. Basically, there were two kinds of games you could play. There were these kind of um, computer terminal shoot 'em ups, and uh, there were these things that told you what was happening with text. And the shoot 'em ups were always the same. The text things, there were these puzzles that you had to solve. And a lot of us were just really into trying to figure out what the puzzle was. We used to trade notes back and forth. Did you find the red cushion yet? Did you. Uh, did you get the scepter? What do you do with the bird? How do you get it out of the cage? All that stuff. I mean, it sounds easy in retrospect, but we had never seen these things before. So it was something that we used to, you know, talk about. When we were just sort of hanging out, not not doing actual classwork or anything. Um, and when someone would have a big breakthrough, we'd go rushing down and say, oh, I think we have to do this. And, you know, it would work or not work. And the maps would come out and notes would get made. And we go back and brainstorm about another way to do it. Again, you know, it sounds like this huge amount of effort for uh, for a game at the time, but that's what there was. Um. Starting with my freshman year, I started writing for the MIT newspaper. It's called The Tech. They're on the top floor of the student center in this big corner suite. The other big corner suite down the hall was a group called the Lecture Series Committee, LSC. And they had um, basically two functions. They used to book the guest lecturers and performers for the year, and they would show movies every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night in one of the lecture halls. They'd just do these second-run movies, so, you know, all the Pink Panther movies, Bond, all that stuff. The way they used to advertise was they had a printing press that printed out these 17 by 22 multicolor uh, posters that they put up all over campus. So, um, that printing press always seemed to be running, even on days when I knew a movie wasn't coming up and that the posters had actually been done. And because the newspaper also ran very late at night on production schedule nights, every now and then I'd wander down to LSC to figure out why this printing press was running full tilt. And there are always these same two or three guys in there, and they were printing something out that clearly wasn't a movie poster. But they were also being very cagey about what it was that they were printing. Uh, so those two guys, well, among those two guys were uh, Mike Dornbrook and Steve Moretzky. Well, I wound up working for LSC as well because I was always there and uh, I got taught how to um, create the posters. I never really got to use the press, but one day I found a stack of the stuff that these guys were printing out. It was like their discard pile because, you know, the registration was off or something. So I helped myself to one copy of everything. It's actually what I have over here, if I can just show it to you. Sorry, I'm mm -hmm. get out of the chair for a second. Sure. I have over here, if I can just show it to you. Sorry, I'm mm -hmm. get out of the chair for a second. Sure. I've, I've kept these since, you know, 78 or 79. This is a. Uh, this is one of the maps they made for Zork One. Mm -hmm. Let me just open it up and show you all the. Yeah, just by okay. So the, you know, the back is here. It describes you know what the symbols are and the legend. Uh, what's interesting here is um, it says map designed by uh, D. 
Arlito and S. Moretzky, copyright 1982, Zork Users Group. So actually, I'm a little off in my memory there. It was probably 8081 when I was when I was seeing this. And then, you know, this is the big map. Yep, let me, uh, let me just double check my focus, make sure that sucker is in as, yep. as well as it goes. Okay. Um, I will happily um, give you high res scans of these too. By yeah. the way. Yeah. The. Um, back to there. Um, yeah, so I have another one for Zork Two. Okay. Actually, all I have right. all, I have all three Zork maps. So they were they were publishing um, maps. For, for playing Zork. They were the uh, Zork users group. Actually, I have, all, I have all three Zork maps. So they were they were publishing um, maps for, for playing Zork. They were the uh, Zork users group. And I guess at that time they were doing two different things. They had the users group which was selling these hint guides and selling the maps for like pocket change. And I seem to remember that they also had sort of the Ziploc, you know, the, the, the baggie with the floppy disk in it version of Zork that they were starting to mail out to people. They were, they were selling it um, basically out of their dorm rooms or out of that office pre-Infocom's um, pre official incorporation. Right. So I'm not exactly sure when they became Infocom. I was probably... They were probably out of MIT by that point and just, you know, using their uh, alum status to continue to use the printing apparatus and stuff like that while um, while they were doing it. While they were doing it, I had definitely met Steve Moretzky my freshman year because um, one of my classmates that year lived in a, a dorm next to mine. There was this dorm at MIT called uh, New House, which was short for New West Campus Housing, and Certain student activities were there. There was a place called French House. Everyone lived in a French house, spoke French. There was German House. They all spoke German. There was a Russian House. Well, as a joke, Moretzky and folks who lived in this other unaffiliated part of the dorm invented a language called Vardibedian, and they became Vardibedian House. So this friend of mine lived in Vardibedian House, and he brought me over one time to meet people, and that's when I first met Steve Moretzky. Uh, do you have... Um, a very wacky sense of humor, you know, uh, we all knew Monty Python inside and out, but you know, him more than anybody else. One of the things I do remember is that um, he had a nickname at the time, they called him Gorilla. He had a, a big plaque that must have been stolen from a zoo somewhere, and it said, you know, Gorilla. And of course, the Latin name for Gorilla is Gorilla Gorilla, so he always thought it was very funny to have a sign on his door that said Gorilla Gorilla Gorilla. Um, he was always just doing practical jokes and things like that. You'd find Vardibedian posters all over campus. In fact, one time he did a, an LSE lecture poster, complete in Vardibedian. It had its own alphabet and its own grammar. And he was always involved in some of the... Uh, and LSE used to do a certain amount of pranking, and he always seemed to be involved there. Um, so, you know, one of the... Yeah, you know, it was it's interesting to to sort of back up and explain the uh the discrepancy, you know, cuz I said 79, I said like 82. One of the things that happens a lot at MIT is even when people graduate, they don't actually leave. Uh in particular if you were involved with one of the big student activities, you sort of had carte blanche to hang around. So, you know, I I took a little longer to graduate than I expected, which happens to a lot of MIT people. Uh, I was supposed to be class of 81. I graduated a few years later. So I continued to write for the newspaper because they wanted me to, and it was a nice place to hang out. I still had friends. So not graduating in 81 left me there for 82 and 83 when they were doing this, which explains why I remember it happening. So, you know, Mark showing up for a weekend, you know, years later is not so um, out of the ordinary. And if I was a freshman, Steve had to have been at least a year ahead of me, and that means that he was hanging around for a while as well. So maybe the, he sort of had the same thing. He had some day gig, but he'd hang out at LSC with all the other guys because that was a good place to meet. They had the printing press. They could do this stuff. It also explains why they would always do it late at night because they had day jobs. So they'd show up on the weekends during the press downtime and just bang out the maps and then pack up their stuff and go. Um... It never, 
it never surprised me that Steve did the games. It actually, when I heard that Infocom was going to be doing a version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that's all I had heard. Someone said, hey, Infocom's doing Hitchhiker's Guide. I, my first reaction was, well, it's got to be Moretzky. He's the only guy who could do it. Because he just had that kind of off-kilter um, British humor sensibility. This is a guy who used to listen to like the Goon Show and stuff like that, and you know, was just a huge fan of that period of British comedy. And there were jokes like that in Zork, but not nearly to the extent that you'd see in some of the later games. So, I mean, I guess I always saw the humor there with Steve. I just made the natural assumption that when Hitchhiker's Guy was being announced that it was going to be him. And then, you know, like a week or two later, I saw him and said, so, you know, you guys are doing Hitchhiker's Guy. not you guys, me. You know, we're still all very jealous of Steve for having been able to work with uh, Doug Adams twice, but... Um, well, yeah, I mean, um, progress. There's still, I mean, Zork 1 was pretty much done because you, you could play it on the terminals and things like that. What I remember there being a lot of talk about back then, especially with uh, Mark, was, I, I guess, the back-end work. They were still hashing out how, what was it, uh, Zill, Zork implementation language. They were still kind of working the bugs out of the, the stuff in the background, and they were constantly trying to figure out how they could sort of uh, expand the number of commands and what it could understand because they knew that that was where the the frustration was for the gamer. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd say things like, uh, pick up the lamp. You know, I don't know how to do that. Get the lamp. Okay, well, I can do that. And, you know, people were constantly complaining to them about stuff like that. And they were constantly trying to uh, accommodate that to the extent that they could. I mean, I even remember when... Uh, Boy, I hope this doesn't wind up in the documentary, but... Uh, <laughs> well, don't say anything you're uncomfortable No, I, I'm not at all. These are my impressions, and okay. I, was, I was an impressionable, you know, undergraduate who was a couple years behind these guys, so, you know, I've never really pretended to have a clue about what was going on. Okay. Um, Steve was just very friendly, very funny. Uh, Mike Dornbrook was nothing but friendly. I mean, he is to this day. Uh, in fact, Steve and Mike... Uh, to me, have barely changed at all since I've known them. Obviously, they've, they've gotten older and they've become successful, but they're the same guys. And, you know, I think to a certain extent, um, for both of them, it, they're, they're still just, you know, I can't believe that I'm in this industry doing this thing and getting paid for it. Uh, so, you know, they, they've always been, um, I mean, they've had their ups and downs with the industry, but I, I think they're just utterly thrilled to still be doing this thing that they were doing, you know, 30 years ago. Um, Mark, you know, I, Mark, you know, I, I always just kind of saw that drive. There was that, you know, because I was a biologist, not uh, an electrical engineer or computer scientist, which is what a lot of these other guys were. I had a lot more exposure to the the pre-med mentality than people in other majors. So, you know, there was this kind of pre-med, the, the utterly driven person who would eat their lunch in the music library while listening to something and reading a textbook at the same time, you know, triple tasking. Uh, Mark wasn't quite that bad, but you definitely knew that he was, you know, working like a maniac to get to med school and to get out. Um, the other thing I remember very specifically is Mark was one of the few people that had a girlfriend. Mark always seemed a, a little more um, distant, at least to people who weren't in the, the inner circle. You know, you'd ask about, you'd ask Steve, you know, how's stuff going with the game? And he'd, he wouldn't tell you, you know, trade secrets or anything. He'd say, you know, we're kind of working on this and the other. You'd ask Mark stuff like that. And I can't talk about it. So that was... That was kind of the impression I had there. Okay. And I will, I will file them as impressions. As a bring on, or did you know them from previous? Previously. The, I'll just tell the story linearly because it's um, pretty quick. Uh, in 84, I got a job as the chief technician at a sleep research laboratory associated with the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I was the guy who coordinated uh, the students who would work on these studies. I wrote the experimental protocols. And there was this other guy in the lab named Walt Freitag, and Walt was the uh, chief technician. He built stuff, 
you know, we need, a, we need a box that does this, he would build it. He'd run the computers, he'd run the cameras, he made sure that the lab ran, you know, electronically. So we would have these, we, we conducted these studies where you'd put people in a room for more than 48 hours with no time, you know, with no clock, no sense of time, and see how their sleep-wake cycle changed. These are now classic studies, but at the time they were very cutting edge. And we were starting to run a number of studies in parallel. We had three people in there over the course of a weekend. And, you know, I'd been working with Walt at this point for a couple of months, but knew almost nothing about him. And Walt wasn't there on this weekend. There was this huge crunch, this big crisis. I was running around like crazy. Everything got taken care of. But I remember on Monday morning when the director of the lab showed up, I said, you know, we had this really crazy weekend. I described everything. I said, where was Walt? And he said, oh, he was um, at the Park Plaza Hotel um, creating another planet. I said, uh, I don't understand. He said, you're going to have to have Walt explain it to you. So Walt showed up like two days later. And I said, I don't know where you were. The director said something about um, creating another planet. Uh, all I know is I'm really pissed because you didn't tell me you'd be gone and we had this horrible weekend and I don't expect you to explain yourself, but I really do want to know just what it was that you were doing that was so important. He said, I'll tell you tomorrow. The next day he shows up with a binder about this thick, full of sheets of very closely um, typewritten paper. I said, what's this? He said, this is what I was doing that last weekend. I started reading through it. It was a game called um, Recon, R-E-K-O-N, Recon 2, which of course implied that there had been a Recon 1. And I started reading through it, and what I was looking at, at least at the front half of the book, was... Um, page upon page of descriptions of characters. There'd be a name at the top and it would say, you are Joe Smith. You are the ambassador from Pluto. You are here on Earth for this weekend in order to negotiate our treaty. I don't even remember the plot anymore. It was something like that. And there were 200 of these character sheets. And then the second half of the book was um, descriptions of items that were in this thing. Um, notes to game masters, notes about plots, uh, special items, and it said to be handed out when so-and-so completes such and such a task. And I was, as I was reading through it, I kind of realized that it was just this giant puzzle and that all of these plots eventually would weave together to some orchestrated ending. And I, I asked him, I said, so this is all like some big thing that people do and you, 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 you kind of have this big blow off at the end. And he said, yeah, exactly. Only, you know, we write the stuff out, we hand parts out to people, and then they are free to improvise their characters based on the information that they have. I said, so they can lie, they can cheat, they can steal, they can do whatever. He said, yeah, we have, you know, simulated combat. It takes place with, you know, index cards. I've got a gun, you know, I've got a shield. So there was no physical contact, but there was, you know, combat nonetheless with 200 people. And it turns out that they ran it at um, Boscone, the annual Boston Science Fiction Convention run by the New England Science Fiction Association, and they had run Recon 1 the previous year. So, uh, combat nonetheless, with 200 people. And it turns out that they ran it at um, Boscone, the annual Boston Science Fiction Convention run by the New England Science Fiction Association, and they had run Recon 1 the previous year. So um, we started talking about that, and about that time, this house that he lived in in Somerville uh, wound up having an open room, and I was looking for a place to live, and he said, why don't you just move in with me and the other two guys, and, you know, we'll, um, we'll split the rent. So I moved in, and I met... Um, another guy named Rick Dutton, and Walt and Rick <clears throat> had been um, freshmen and uh, lived in the same dormitory at Harvard. This is when I found out some of the backstory. Walt and Rick, another guy named Mike Massimilla, and a fellow named Mike Munson, uh, created a student activity called the Society for Interactive Literature. Uh, it was a way to get student activity money for pizza for their weekend D&D games. And, you know, they, they drew some incredibly tiny pittance, like maybe $50 a month or whatever the student activity doled out for the Society for Interactive Literature. And then they found out that they'd actually have to show 
something for what they'd done over the course of the year. And they'd been talking about this idea of how, you know, D&D was okay as far as it went. You can be very clever as a, a dungeon master, but you're still sitting around the table not doing anything. So they got this idea that they would basically kind of like run a little D&D campaign with people acting out the parts in a physical space. That's when they got the idea of, you know, approaching the people at Boscone. Can we run this little game? People actually signed up via the Boscone application. The first game was only uh, somewhere between 40 and 60 people. I don't remember the exact number. But that game has been run oh, probably dozens of times since then in various locations. But it really started to take off. Uh, by the time I moved in, these guys were working on Recon 3. And although they wanted me to write a game with them, they insisted that I uh, participate in the game first so I could see what it was like from the player's perspective before I started writing for them. And there were, by that time, for Recon 3, I think there were almost a dozen different people who were writing on these things. Um, I played the game. They gave me a, uh, a horrible part to play. Uh, it was a... Uh, a high fantasy thing, you know, multiple kingdoms. There were elves and dwarves. It was kind of Lord of the Rings-ish, but not exactly. I was the ghost of the recently killed king. So I could talk to people. I couldn't do anything to them. I couldn't carry anything. I had no objects. The only thing I could do all weekend long was negotiate and occasionally haunt somebody. And I realized after the fact that they were really testing me by giving me the hardest part in the game to see what I would come up with because they figured that if I could get decent at it then you know the writing part wouldn't be that hard and after that I started writing these games um, at about the same time I mentioned earlier we had um, hooked up with Andy Greenberg who had been living with us for a while while he worked on this project we had been beta testing uh, wizardry for the Mac for him and at that point Andy and Walt and Rick and Mike started talking about sort of combining some of what Andy was trying to do in wizardry, which was um, directing you down a certain path and generating random encounters with the kind of interaction that you'd see from these live action games. And the answer they came up with was sort of this hybrid um, directed text adventure where the, the function of the computer was solely to keep track of where you were. It was an outer space game, so keep track of where you were in outer space and what kind of stuff you were carrying on your ship. If you upgraded your ship, the computer knew about it so that you, you couldn't cheat that way. But everything else you did, you were directed to a page in a book. There were ten books and they were full of text. So for Rick, Walt, and were directed to a page in a book. There were ten books, and they were full of text. So for Rick, Walt, and Mike, it was pretty much the same as writing one of these games. You know, there were different... In this case, it was for, I think, six people could play simultaneously. They had to sort of really ramp down the number of people who could participate simultaneously from you know, 200 to 6, because a Mac Plus at the time really couldn't handle much more. And it would be just become much too complicated to track more than about that many people through a game like this. But the people, who were, the players could, you know, they'd read things and they'd, they'd do what was directed to them in these almost like choose-your-own-adventure booklets. But at the same time, they could negotiate with each other. Hey, I'm heading to this planet. Why don't I learn what's going on there? Tell you guys. And if you find it's useful, you can go back there. Or, hey, I'm going to pick up a load of this particular... Um, uh, item in the game. We can cross paths over here and I'll trade you some of this item for the other. So it was sort of the same idea, that sort of cooperative item economy, uh, a certain amount of player diplomacy, but all mediated through this um, this unthinking computer um, game master, for want of a better word. So they, you know, we wound up um, play testing that, a lot of us wound up play testing that game for about a year. You know, they had things written out and there was no computer, but they had a map. So they would keep track of where you were on a map and they pretty much knew what the functionality of the computer was. They had a little screen and they would just, you know, hand you a card so the computer says to read this or do that. And, you know, while they were testing it that way for playability and just content, you know, Andy was off trying to figure out how to program the computer to do the right thing. 
the maps themselves were an interesting issue because um, it's a map of a region of space. There's lots of little triangles that connect together. And um, every time you played the game, you know, the computer would randomly distribute the planets that you would land on in different parts of the map. Um, the way you would dictate movement was to say, okay, I'm on a red triangle. My move is yellow, green, blue, red, green. You can move up to five, I think it was, and the computer would keep track. As it turns out, any path that you told the computer from where you were was unique and could not be confused with any other path. So Andy, who was a computer science major back at Cornell, called up one of his old math professors and said, I think I've got a paper here about movement across a triangle tiled flat surface. And I, I think there was actually a little monograph published about this sort of derivative of the four color map theorem, but that's just, you know, an odd little footnote to it. But the map had this weird historical value in that it did this very, it had this very specific function that worked very well and also happened to generate a math paper. Um, Andy and Mike wound up moving down to Florida. Andy had been recently married and they formed a company called Interplay to publish Star Saga. Um, Star Saga was distributed by Electronic Arts. And um, the idea was that Star Saga was always going to be a trilogy. So Star Saga 1 was called um, Beyond the Boundary. Star Saga 2 was called The Clathrin Menace. The Clathrins were the, the evil aliens. And I have no idea what Star Saga 3 was going to be called because Interplay folded up before 3 was ever published. Now. Having read enough of the, the books and played the games, I realized that Star Saga was just a computer version of Recon 2. It was the big intergalactic treaty negotiation thing, only Star Saga 1 was, it was sort of supposed to be this very classic expanding view kind of story. So Star Saga 1 started out with just a couple of people who, as they moved through the game, discovered that there was this very big thing going on. And then Star Saga 2 introduces the big menace. So it was a classic movie-type story arc, only we never found out how it ended. And in fact, the catchphrase for all of these live-action games, because they'd advertise them, was, you know, here you are, you're a, post off, you're, you're a postal carrier in Poughkeepsie, New York, but, and always in big letters, something strange is going on. That was always their, their tagline. And the idea for all these games is to figure out what strange thing was going on. Um, Things ended pretty badly for Interplay. Uh, uh, Mike wound up getting divorced over the way the company was kind of turning out, and his wife was unhappy. Uh, they all had a falling out with Andy. Uh, Rick was going through medical school, so you could only put so much time into it. Uh, Andy wound up with the assets of the company, which you know I have no idea if they were worth anything. I think he probably has whatever's left of the inventory of, uh, of the games. Uh, Star Saga 1 won a number of computer game awards. Um, you know, Walt has a statuette sitting in his house somewhere, so does Rick, so does Mike. Um, but it was kind of the wrong place at the wrong time for it. It wasn't quite a graphical adventure, it wasn't quite an old school text adventure. It, it never really found its niche, and I think that EA at the time just had no real idea what to do with it. Uh, the game is still out there. You can go online and uh, like go to Wikipedia and look up Star Saga, and someone has managed to uh, probably either scan in or type up everything that's in Star Saga 1 and sort of reverse engineer the game mastering movement engine, which at the time they thought was reasonably sophisticated, but of course, you know, 20 years later, it's pretty much child's play to, to, to recreate. It was, a, it was a fun game. Um, my contribution there was, you know, just lots of play testing and suggestions about things. I had actually campaigned rather strongly to be one of the writers for the game, but um, people's wives had preference over, uh, over other people. So, uh, around what time is this? Um, 85. Okay. 1985. Um, you know, were they trying to break into a market 
of text adventures, or was it just more general games? It was more general. You know, we 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 played games incessantly. You know, we we lived. There was this attic above the, the house where we live, and it was the game room. And it was just there was a wall. It was floor to ceiling with every board game imaginable, and. There was a closet that was full of even more games. The ones that didn't work, that failed somehow, all wound up to the closet. I mean, the worst, the worst condemnation of a game from us was, oh, that's, that's closet worthy. We're never going to play that again. You, know, you play a game once and figure out where the flaw was or what the winning condition was that couldn't be met, and it would be gone. But uh, we started playing a lot of computer games because all of a sudden we had this Mac that is sitting there for our wizardry play testing, a Mac that was given to Andy Greenberg by Steve Jobs so he could write the game for the Mac. Um, so we were playing um, Ultima 3, which had just come out on um, Rick's old Apple II. We were playing um, some of the other computer-based text adventure games. And... Um, I think they knew that they wanted the computer in there because that seemed to be where the market was and the only way they were going to get, I mean, there wasn't any practical way to get the sort of live role-playing experience to be profitable because you're basically piggybacking on a hotel and a science fiction convention, but if you could sort of put it in the box, then um, there was a chance that there could actually be a livelihood made out of it. And I remember Andy was really kind of the guy who was pushing them to uh, commercialize it this way, if you will. You know, you can keep writing those other games, they're always going to be great and creative, but more people are going to see it if you do this thing. So it wasn't so much that they were trying to emulate text adventures or anything else that was out there, it's just what they knew how to do, and Andy sort of had this idea about how a computer could be involved. I mean, by that point, and I'm probably wrong on the timeline here, Zork started to get a bit more graphical as well. You'd started, you know, winding up being able to click on images and move through um, through the physical space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they saw, they saw that all of these traditional games were kind of going toward the, you know, a computer-assisted, for want of a better word, um, direction. But since, um, I mean, the, the books are illustrated, but there was nothing on the computer that had illustration. Anything you saw on the computer was just a... Um, not even a printout, it was just on the screen. You know, the computer would go ding, you'd have to go over and, and read what it said on the screen. So I think that was kind of a, an odd um, intermediate concept that never really took off and maybe was always doomed to fail for that very reason. People aren't going to just get up from the table and all lean over and look at the, the computer monitor to see what it told you. I'm surprised to uh, one thing that you... We should avoid scuffing with the uh, Oh, tell you what, let me just kick them off. And... Okay. Um, what strikes me interesting in that context, though, is that, well, first of all, there's two made. That means that they made one, and someone thought, let's make another one of these. Well, they, they had the, I mean, they knew the plot for all three. And basically, once you've written the first game, at least from the, the point of view of the programming, you know, everything else... I don't want to say it's just writing because, of course, the writing is actually the most important part there. But because it was a game that was based on a plot that they knew that they had run, I mean, Recon 2 at that point had been run at least two or three times, and they took notes on how the games turned out each case and what characters wound up being important and so on. So, you know, as Star Saga 1 was being packaged and put on the shelves, they were already writing Star Saga 2 because at that point all the computer needs to know is the names of the planets, what's on them, and you know what the trade items are because you could either pick up from where you left off with Star Saga 1 or start Star Saga New clean. Um, and you know, there had been, I guess, every intent on you know 3 making it to the shelves, but I was never really uh, privy to what happened with EA other than them saying, you're not selling enough, which is a, something that EA has said for most of its existence. But uh, Well, the, the, uh, the thing that strikes me is, um, you know, there's also SSI. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea what's happening. Star Saga without the books is, and that was actually their copy protection. Because there were so many books with so many pages, they knew that somebody wouldn't just be copying a disc around and circulating it and, you know, 
not that there was a lot of pirating back then, but the point was you couldn't play the game if you didn't have the box full of books and the map. The map was very important. Um, there was a series of games that we played around that time that we were very impressed with that came out on the Mac. There was a company called Mindscape, and uh, I'm not going to remember the names of these games right now, but one was a detective game and one was sort of a horror game, and it was graphical in the sense that there was a picture of what you were seeing on the screen with text underneath. You're in the living room and you need to be able to go to one of these two rooms. You could pick things, you could carry items around, you know, the haunted house one you had to escape the haunted house with your life, the private eye one you had to solve the mystery without without getting killed yourself. They were hard games too. I mean, we, we, we spent a lot of time working our way through those. I, oh, um, the horror game was called The Uninvited. And I can't remember what the um, the private eye game was called, mm -hmm. but that was sort of like the the goal to which this group aspired. I mean, Star Saga was great, but if you could write something like that where you could actually look on the screen and see the stuff that you were doing, mm -hmm. that would have been great. Yeah, we had a debate over whether or not they were fine, like it is. Okay. Um, oh, free soundtrack. Yeah, happens sometimes. And. Um, if you could put it down and pick it up again and show it. Sure. Yeah, so All right. this is the, uh, this isn't the map that I generated when I was um, a freshman playing it on the terminal. This is the version that I generated um, when I was playing a version that had been collected on um, some PC disc that I mentioned earlier. It's actually a very strange collection. It was for a PC Junior, which was my first computer uh, that I owned. And so it had uh, Life, Adventure, uh, the old Eliza program, a bunch of other stuff that I guess was considered public domain at the time. Because of MIT. Well, exactly. I mean, it, it really is because it was a program, it was a game that was written by MIT programmers. Um, the computer science department at that time was kind of moving in that direction because they were seeing that, well, at, at, I'm, I'm not, I can guess here, I'm guessing that Zork probably ran on a DEC PDP 10 or 11 uh, because that's what most of the computers were on campus at that time. Although I guess the big dial-up time-sharing machines were still these old Honeywell boxes that they had that ran this um, sharing system called Multics. But um, it would be my guess that they wanted to get away from Multics and they might even want to get away from the um, uh, the PDPs and by 82 or so we're starting to see the first rumblings from Apple and IBM so it would make perfect sense that they would want to write something in such a way that whichever computer won would be the one that they could run their games on. Um, so I think it was a combination of uh, perhaps accidental foresight, uh, wanting to be very clever because they could, because you know, that's what they were learning, and because that's what they were taught. Um.